Hi there. Um, thanks to Creative Time for inviting me. Um, and thanks for putting me directly after Laurie, because there, there couldn't be, in some ways, two more closely linked presentations and two more diametrically um, opposed presentations in some ways, because I'm going to warn you right now, I'm going to be talking about prisons as well, and I'm not going to show you any. I'm going to be talking about the people who are housed in prisons, and I'm going to show you no photographs of them. So um, be prepared with that. I will take my um, eight minutes. I'll try to get through the whole presentation. So this is a project I've been doing for um, about five years now. It started as a project, a very rhetorical project, called Architecture and Justice, which was displayed at the Architectural League of New York. Um, the premise behind actually all the work that I do um, is starting with a data set, and data is fundamentally designed, has an effect on policy, the built environment, and on people, and there's a vicious feedback loop which, um, which feeds the system. Okay, so I'm going to try and talk about three things today, finding data and repurposing it, mapping data for advocacy and communication, and putting that data to work in New Orleans. I'm also going to add an extra section on what, some work I'm doing with the probation department um, in New York City. Not really, is there a lag? Yeah. So this is the data set we start with, which is data that is released by the court, not to the public, but released by court to track um, people through the prison system. Um, instead of looking at this data set in terms of what crime was committed, we look at the home address of the incarcerated person and make maps. So this is a map of um, all the incarcerated people in Brooklyn in the year 2003, and every bright red splotch is a high concentration of people who are housed in prison. So added by, up block by block that year, there were $359 million spent to imprison people from Brooklyn that year. Um, and mostly they come from the city's poorest neighborhoods. These are lines that link the home addresses of people in prison to where they are housed um, in upstate New York. From a demographic point of view, the spending facilitates a mass migration of people to prison, importantly 95% of whom come, come home. Um, and this is what some of their homes um, look like. This is a map of Brownsville in Brooklyn of um, 11 census blocks and the cost of how much it costs to house somebody over the course of their incarceration in prison. So we call those million-dollar blocks, um, 11 of them over there, each, each uh, block of some of the most extreme poverty in New York City. That's what's being spent on those, on those people. So our project at the beginning was very rhetorically to ask, isn't there a better way um, of spending this money rather than cycling people back and forth and back and forth to prison? We've done this in a number of ways. We've run scenario planning workshops. Um, we've been working since the result of that workshop was to define two census uh, tracts in Brownsville, Brooklyn, where we've been working with Common Ground Association linking uh, homelessness to incarceration and really trying to identify some things that you can actually do at the, in, the, in the neighborhood um, with that problem. The work has also been shown at uh, the Design and the Elastic Mind at the Museum of Modern Art. It's actually in the collection, I'm proud to say. We've also um, done, we've just um, released an online version which shows this data across 25 states um, in the country, and it's, it, you can go to the website, justiceatlas.org. Um, our collaborators have also introduced this as a bill into Congress. I can take no credit for this myself. I did not, I did not go and stand in any lobby halls, thank goodness. Um, and we've also done work on the ground with um, high school kids in New Orleans as, as well as many um, other community groups um, across the country. So just to quickly talk about the work in New Orleans, we presented it to the, uh, to the city council, um, which uh, you know, try to explain the premise behind the project to them. Um, and if you, if you, you know, we give lots and lots of presentations like this. So we were really trying to show how um, in 2003, New Orleans had the highest incarceration in the country, which meant it had the highest in the world. We used the data set to pick a specific neighborhood, central city. 
which is heavily um, disinvested because of this highway which passes through the neighborhood. It used to be the center of black entrepreneurship. We, co we found that there were a lot of incredibly active um, not-for-profits and community groups working in the area, and what we did was simply to take a lot of funding money that was coming all around the country into New Orleans and bringing those groups together to overlap those networks to, um, to uh, yeah, really to overlap the, the funding, and, and it resulted in, in a few... Um, in a few projects that, that actually resulted, which actually were implemented. So using maps as tools, our research is focused on defining spatial patterns that link poverty, racial segregation, and incarceration, and on how they repeated coincidence takes on identifiable urban forms. Right, so in, in this case, it was this one highway very close to downtown, this very disinvested neighborhood, um, which we sort of um, really initiated connections between a lot of organizations and got them to work together. So for instance, this was one of the projects which was a, um, a community health clinic which was in a bus which was moving all um, across the city and in this case we really persuaded them that Central City was one of the locations that they, that they, that they should be working in. Um, the same thing with the, this after-school program, is, um, training, training kids how to make maps of their own environment to advocate for themselves. And again, this was done across the city, but we were really advocating for it to happen in Central City. And it was really a, a place that, that people sort of ignored in the city, and, and our work really helped to bring a lot of um, funding and action to, to that place. So the tragedy of, uh, of New Orleans, um, just to, to repeat Laurie's presentation, is that although all this kind of work is going on, there is a big prison underway, the renovation of the prison that's being planned. Um, and, you know, I think really the question for New Orleans is, are they going to support that extra structure of cycling people and money from their neighborhoods back to prison, or are they going to... Um, introduce an infrastructure which keeps people and their money um, in the neighborhood. I want to quickly make sure that I get to the work I'm doing with the probation department right now, focusing on the fact that 650,000 people return home every year from prison, um, mostly for non-violent and not such important crimes. Um, and this map over here is the map of where probationers um, Come, come home to, you know, Harlem, the Bronx, East Brooklyn, et cetera. Um, the probation office in Brooklyn um, is somewhere over here in Brooklyn Heights, and you can see this is where most people on probation live. Um, there's an enlightened um, probation, uh, director of probation right now who is um, focusing on putting the probation officers in the neighborhoods that they should be in rather than so far away. But the most important thing is I've been put on this committee to redesign probation rooms because um, this is what they look like right now. So in that, as we heard in the last presentation too, that people who come home from, from prison um, actually undergo more and more punishment. They're not allowed back into public housing. They're not allowed back, um, you know, a lot of jobs you, you cannot get with a, with a prison record, etc. So I think that a probation office should not be called a waiting room. It should have music, number one. <laughs> there should be um, <laughs> resource centers. There should, be, there should be all kinds of things in this room. The, the furniture should not be um, set up in rows, etc. So anyway, we have 90 days to submit proposals for the redesign of probation rooms across the city. So check in in 90 days and I'll tell you what's going on.